In the city of Detroit, the name Toco is both respected and feared by anyone with the slightest knowledge of its underworld history. They are the survivors of a bloody prohibition war that conquered their enemies and established what is now known as the Detroit Partnership. They are a special breed. Not so far down the bloodline, a great-grandchild is born into the Toco clan, but he's known as a defado, a man whose lineage is not full Sicilian. Even worse, his Sicilian lineage comes from his mother, making him ineligible to ever make a real name for himself in the Toco regime. But this man is a Toco and will grow up strong in the ways of Cosa Nostra. He will serve his family and strike fear into the hearts of anyone that is crazy enough to challenge him. With fists like steel and a disposition to match, he will use his genetic fearlessness and a vicious cunning to pursue a life of crime that is hard to top. This is the legend of Alan Gunner Lindblom. I wouldn't know a gunman if I saw one. Gangster era son. Time feuds of public enemies bring a reign of terror and baffle police. How did this famous gangster treat you? He treated me wonderful. This here, what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing, this is my doom, 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 doom. Gunner, yeah, he doesn't know this. We've got a running joke on the show. I knew a guy named Gunner Wolf in a coding class. I used to be an IT guy. <laughs> I talked about what a badass name Gunner is. My life would be different if I was Gunner Crooks. How cool was that name, right? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So as soon as I meet you, I'm like, nobody's going to call me Gunner anymore. <laughs> That's funny. It kind of sucks. You're still the crook. The people from my old life knew me as Al. My new life, I'm Gunner, which is my real middle name for the record. My real middle name is Gunner. And um, my wife my wife calls me that. Um, I'll, some of my friends do. But my wife has kind of differentiated the old me from the new me by no longer calling me Al. That Al was the bad guy. Gunner's the good guy. And so you can call me either one, whatever you want. Gunner is it's fine. So that was the interview. It was interesting. Uh, we just kind of met by chance how God throws people in your path. And I really believe that. But uh, we met, decide we're going to do his biography. And if you know this guy, he is amazing in that he does like 101 videos in a month or something. I don't know what it is, but he's on different shows. If he's driving to the store, this guy's like filming a video. So when he first got a hold of me, he's like, yeah, I'll do it, man. I'll give you an hour. You know, and I'm, that's not how we do it. You know, it is a journey. You know, from beginning to end, it is a lot of work and a lot of uh, time and commitment. And it's funny because a lot of people tell me that, uh, man, it sounds like you guys are just winging it, you know, and uh, which is cool. I love no, that. No, but no, no, no. you guys know, yeah, it takes yeah. two weeks worth of solid sleepless nights to make this sound effortless. I appreciate it. And of course, all, all the people that listen. So we got to skip a lot of the fanfare that we normally do in Banner because this is going to be a long show. Last week, we did uh, Jigani, the chin. And we had a segment in there about Frank DeChico getting blown up instead of John Gotti and uh, really got a lot of response to that, a lot. And uh, when I posted things of Frank DeChico, I did his car and stuff on Instagram. If you don't follow us on Instagram, it's the Partners in Crime podcast. You should follow us. And uh, I got a lot of personal messages and stuff, you know, saying that my father knew him, my brother knew him. He was in our neighborhood. The guy was loved, you know, and uh, we'll have to really look into him more and do a show about him sometime because... I can't remember the last time I got that much emotional reaction about somebody we talked about. But uh, one of the best things I got, a guy I talked to, you know, on Instagram and stuff, and we text back and forth. His name is Joe Antonura, and he was a Colombo, and he shoots me a message and says, hey, man, I was there. You know, so I got his take on it, and I'd like to read that because it was, of all the things I got, this was the most compelling. And it was cool. It's like a piece of history, right? Right. I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. It's basically a short story with five of us that day. Myself, John Calandra, Jimmy's brother, John Padone, Joey Milano, and Fabrizio D. We were headed to the club for some reason, not sure of the reason though, so many years ago. We were halfway there when the car blew up, it shook us to the core. We seen Frankie, or what was left of him. It was crazy. What I heard was they were aiming for John and they got confused because of the way they walk and their body size. Then someone else was saying it was payback on him because Frankie set it up. And he's talking about the Castellano hit. It was Frankie that uh, got him over to Spark Steakhouse. Okay. So it was confusing. All I know was that day will never be taken out of my head. The noise, the smell, all of it. 
there's a lot of shit that happened though in the years on Bath Avenue. A lot of stuff some people don't know or don't remember. And uh, the rest of it's kind of a personal exchange between me and him, but really cool. You know what I mean? I think that's cool. Like when uh, Catolo gave us a little uh, clip of the Gemini, right? Yeah. I get a ton of this stuff and it's all cool. Like I read every bit of it and I answer every bit of it. So if, if you got something, you know, please send it to me. Like I said, the best way is on Instagram. And uh, I've built a lot of relationships that way that, that go on and on. And really great people. And, uh, Joe, great guy, you know, and I uh, love talking to him. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we hear a lot more from him because I, I really like this guy. And uh, thanks, Joe. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that, that was very kind. Partners in crime, welcome back. It's been a long two weeks if we were still at the big round table. Now it's a metaphorical round table. We've got Zach the Zip Griffith. Of course. Great to be back. And across we have our new regular, Anne Marie Giuliano, back by popular demand. Yes, thanks to all the fans out there. All right, I got a lot of good uh, comments about you. It's kind of weird. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and I had a weird experience as I'm getting this all set up, the computer set up and everything, and this, this dude walks in, and I'm like, who the heck is this, right? Do you guys remember Joshua the intern? Vaguely. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Apparently he's back. At first I'm thinking it can't be Joshua the intern, you know, because I'm setting everything up, but if it was Joshua the intern, he'd be doing exactly, it, right? Exactly. Yeah, so it can't be, but no, it turns out it is him, he's just not doing his job. Mm. But, uh, yeah, now, notice that's a foreshadowing. I'm not doing my job as an intern, so I might be getting a promotion. Does squat for a month that comes back asking for a promotion and a raise. Behind the scenes, Joshua, the intern, has been hard at work. He's still doing research and helping out. He's still a valuable part of the team. I'm just busting his chops. Whatever. So I don't know how many people know this story. He's kind of blowing up. He's everywhere. But there's a, there's a few things that set this guy apart, and I want you to understand that right off the bat. He's a descendant of the Toco family, which in Detroit is literally like being a Luciano. Like they started this whole thing. He is mob royalty. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing is this guy is not the average guy. He's an extraordinary person. He is huge. He's a fighter. He's a deadly fighter. Think Galani, right? On top of that, super intelligent, like a high IQ, 130 kind of guy. He is a highly acclaimed writer. He's writing novels, and people are already saying, like, he's writing on a world-class level. So I want you to keep this stuff in mind as you're listening to the story, because this is not some run-in-the-mill jabroni that you know, lived a gangster life in Detroit. There's several things about him, and it's going to come through because he is like the gangster Forrest Gump. Amazing things happen to this guy every day. You know, so he's a fascinating kind of character. I can't wait for our audience to meet him and you're going to love this story. And uh, I'm really excited. We got a big night ahead. And so let's get started. Alan Gunnar Lindblom is born in April of 1973 to parents George Lindblom and Grace Carmela Toko. When it comes to organized crime in the Detroit arena, Gunnar is not without a certain pedigree. His grandfather, Peter, is a renowned and respected boss. Grace is the daughter of Peter and Grace Toko, and they are not well pleased with her choice in husbands. George Lynn Bloom is Swedish and is an outsider in a very clannish and secretive family. His great-grandfather, an immigrant from Terracini, Sicily, is Joe Toko, known as the Beer Baron of Wyandotte, and was a leader in Detroit's West Side Gang. His arrest record shows 11 apprehensions since 1915, charges ranging from arson, bootlegging, income tax evasion, and of course, murder. He may have ascended to the boss of the organization, a position made available by the murder of previous boss Cesar Chester Lamari, had he not been the victim of revolver and shotgun fire on the evening of May 2nd, 1938, in front of his friend James Palazzola's house on Antoine Street. Joe Toko was cousin to none other than William Black Bill Toko, regarded as the Detroit crime family's founder. Black Bill established the organization in 1931 after his ascension, which followed a violent street war in the years following Prohibition. So there's an interesting story about Joe Toko, and Al kind of explains it here. You know, it's funny how things get passed along to you, you know. My grandfather never would talk about that story. And I asked him, he didn't want to talk about it. He got very emotional, very angry. My grandfather never got angry. Like, I want to see him, like, mad, like, three times in my whole life. So William Toko and Joe Toko were raised as brothers. There was a the big mafia war in the old country, and they... Everybody was running and hiding. And, and so they hid 
Joe, my great grandfather, under the guise that he was William Vito Toko's brother. Now they were raised up together since babies, so they never knew. And I guess when he was like 20, his aunt was like, "Yo, you're not really brothers. You're, you're cousins," which is no big deal. They loved each other, I guess. William Vito Black Bill Toko goes to prison. I think tax evasion. And at the time, he was the boss. Joe, my great grandfather, Joe Toko was uh, Giuseppe, and so he, he was murdered. Uh, something to do with, I don't know, money from bootlegging, I can't remember, but he I don't know the particulars, but he was killed. Now, you would expect anyone who kills the boss's brother to come out and kill that mother effer, right? Well, he didn't. He got out, and this mother effer somehow ends up working for the family, becoming like a you know top brass. He becomes you know a made guy. I don't know. So, Nobody really knows why. I don't know why. I think the dude had a bunch of freaking money. And he was able to kind of somehow buy his way out of it. Maybe um, William Vito Toko and Joe Toko had a beef over something. I don't know. But whatever the case is, he was allowed to live. The killer was allowed to, to live. And then he was murdered, though, I think not that long. Like 10 years later, he was killed. My grandpa would never talk about it. So I don't really know you know, what happened. But um, that's what I know. That was a good story. Yeah. So I'm thinking here, let's have Re read that article. So we're going to go ahead and read this. I dug this up. It's an article probably from the Detroit Free Press, and it's titled Michigan Mobster Joe Toko Succumbs. And this is the story of how his great-grandfather died. And there's a picture of him, too. Yep, dapper-looking guy. Yes. Uh, May 3rd, 1938, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Detroit mafioso Joe Toko died at Wyandotte General Hospital of gunshot wounds suffered the previous night. Toko, a native of Terracini, Sicily, was regarded as a leader of the Detroit area's West Side Gang. Authorities knew him as the Beer Baron of Wyandotte and as organizer of rackets in downriver communities. At the time of his murder, he was the proprietor of the Kitty Cat Beer Garden, 635 South Bayside Avenue. About six months earlier, he shut down a gambling establishment. At 9.30 in the evening of May 2nd, Toko parked his scarlet red sedan on Antoine Street and emerged. Shots were immediately fired at him from a shotgun and a revolver. Toko ran from the car to the rear door of 215 Antoine Street, home of his longtime friend, James Palazzolo. As he ran, the guns continued to fire. The gunfire halted as Toko stumbled through the doorway into Palazzolo's kitchen. Tony Bazo, a neighbor of Palazzolo, took Toko to the hospital. Police interviewed Toko in his hospital room, but the mafioso claimed he was unable to identify the shooters. Early in the morning of May 3rd, Toko received a blood transfusion from his brother Peter and went into surgery. Doctors tended to six bullet wounds in the gang boss's back. Four slugs were removed. The damage to Toko's internal organs was too great to repair, and Toko died of an internal hemorrhage that afternoon. An hour after his death, some children, playing in the field about 100 yards from the scene of the Toko shooting, found a sawed-off shotgun in a ditch. Police determined that the gun had been fired twice and then jammed. It contained four unfired shells. The authorities considered the possibility that Toko was killed as the result of a romantic affair. While he was married and had children, Toko was reportedly spending a good deal of time with Mrs. Gina Rossi, wife of a former Toko business partner. There was also suspicion that out-of-town gunmen had been brought in to murder Toko. The previous Friday, two men asked Wyandotte police officers for directions to Toko's beer garden establishment. So it appears uh, Toko, the article goes on to say, may have been eliminated in order to cement a new East-West alliance in the Detroit underworld. But it's speculating, and that's the kind of thing when you're doing this. And I think this depiction is like kind of put together much, much later, not like not that long ago, but it's using a series of Detroit Free Press articles to kind of conglomerate the story, if you will, or to kind of put the story together. There's things I know were wrong. Like they talked about William Black Bill Toko and said that apparently the two weren't related when they were obviously related. You know, they were cousins raised as brothers. So it's, it's not perfect. Well, the other story states that police were searching for a brunette woman known as the sweetheart of Joe Toko. They were just talking. Ah. <laughs> he was upset about something. She wanted to talk, and that's all that. You know, I bet a lot of the time they were spending together was at night. Zach, we got to stick together on this, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's there's a lot of articles to this effect and stuff. But uh, it's interesting because Gunner doesn't seem to have a lot of interest in this. And I kind of get where he's coming from. He's like, look, I was a tool to them. And all they did was use me. And they were going to throw me away. And 
I don't miss him, you know? He's got a buddy, uh, Scott Bernstein, that's a great Detroit historian, like 10 times what I'll ever be, if not a thousand times more. And he's got a lot of this history and stuff, and he knows more about it, obviously, than we're going to. His grandfather, Peter Toko, is adamant that he be named Alonzo, but his parents are apparently not sold on it. His father wants him to be named Gunner, which, of course, is a badass name. When a compromise is reached, he is christened Alan, an American version of the Sicilian namesake, and his middle name is to be Gunner. I guess I go back to being the meat hook. <laughs> <laughs> the marriage between George and Grace Lindblom is far less than ideal, and in the end, it only lasts about four years before Grace takes the children and moves in with her parents. So this early part of the story intrigued me because I couldn't get a handle on uh, what happened exactly and how it might have affected him. You know, before I talk to him, I go through and I listen to all his interviews and I do all the research I can. So I come in guns loaded, right? So to speak. So it's, it's always awkward in the interview because it's just getting started and I have to get really deep and personal right away. So here's me like kind of getting him to talk about his parents. So I want to go back to your earliest memories. Do you remember that time when it's you, your parents, and you're less than four? Yeah. I don't have a lot of memories of that. I have a few memories, but the, the, the most vivid memories are of my father, drunk father, beating up my mother. Just a few other little memories in the house. and around. You know, I crashed over the Christmas tree accidentally when I was a kid. Um, you know, my dog, whatever. But the, the ones that stand out is my drunk dad come home and slap the shit out of my mom. And uh, then, the, you know, that's why they divorced when I was four. Do you remember your dad? He never beat you, right? No. Like your dad didn't slap you around? No. Like, did your mom kick him out? My dad was a drunk and my mom just, she basically said she's leaving him and took us kids to my grandparents' house, my grandma and grandpa Toko. And that was the end of it. It's kind of a funny story. I was talking to my dad not a year or two ago. And I was talking about that time, and my dad says, you know, I was a lucky guy. Had your mother gone back to your uncles and told them how I was treating her, I could have came up missing, yes. you know, and that would have been bad. It's like saying that I slapped around a Gambino girl in New York. Yeah. You know, it's it's mental. That anybody would lay a hand on her, it's insane. Yeah. You wouldn't do it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that was my question, like, how does this even happen? It's almost like Godfather when he's smacking around Connie, you know, like, you know what's coming. It's exactly like that. I, I always compared my dad to that Carlos or that Gianni Russo character. Um, that's who my dad was, that guy. It's exactly like that. And my mother had loved him till the day she died. She left him, had a nervous breakdown. We went and lived with my grandparents, but she would never say what he did because she knew that he would end up dead. So they didn't. my uncles didn't like him to begin with. Even the boss, Jack Coco, you know, who is the Don of Detroit my whole life, I know until he got to know me and I got older, I, he kind of looked at me and like, I don't know, I felt like it. Maybe it was not true. Maybe it's just me with a complex. But I felt like he looked at me like I was a, a representation of my dad who he didn't like. But my parents were at Jack Toko's wedding where Frank Sinatra sang, by the way. Um, allegedly, Frank Sinatra didn't want to sing there because he didn't think Jack Toko was a big deal. And Sam Giacana pulled him aside and said, you're going to sing at this guy's wedding. You never disrespect someone like him. And that's when, that's when you know, Frank Sinatra realized that this Jack Toko guy, whoever he is, he's the big deal. Sam Giancana calls and says, oh, disrespect this man. You go sing at his wedding. And, and he did. My, my parents were there at his wedding. But anyways, it's just, yeah, my dad was the Carlo dude from, from The Godfathers. Same character, real life. And it makes sense if she never told him. I always, because as soon as I'm reading this stuff, I'm like, why didn't somebody smack this guy around? That makes sense. So your mother, you said before that your mother had mental problems. It's because of this, right? It's because of the abuse? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It was my dad's abuse. Oh. In my novel, to be a King novels, the main character's mother is kind of was a reflection of my mother, except she's Jewish and that the family didn't really like her and she had like a mental issue. So you read my novels and you get to that point where you meet his mother. It's not a main character, but that character who she had mental problems, she kind of, King Falcone, her, her son always has taken care of her all her life and cooks the meals and cleans the house. And she's just kind of this zombie woman who pops her meds every day and like watches freaking Oprah. So anyways, that was kind of based on my mother. It was the same way, you know? 
So it'd be accurate to portray your mom as having more emotional issues than mental issues. She's kind of broken. Yeah, no, she would have nervous breakdowns and and is what they label them, and she would kind of go off her rocker. Um, then they get her medicated, and she'd calm down, and she'd be good for a while. But even when she was medicated, she was kind of like a zombie, just kind of. My mother was a very, very adoring mother. She loved me more than life itself. If she had $5, it would last her a week for food. She wouldn't eat for a week just so I had 5 bucks, so I could go out and hang out with my friends and get, a, get some beer when I was a teenager or something. I could do no wrong. No matter what I did, I could do no wrong. You know, I love her. She was the sweetest, kindest, most gentle woman I've ever known. I feel like God took her away early because she was better than this place. She was better than this world. She deserved better. She's like she was an angel. And you're about she's about as close as you could get to someone being without sin. She, she married my dad as a virgin when she was like 22 years old, and just you know, she was very naive. She was, lived a sheltered life because where we grew up was this very secretive enclave in Gross Point, Michigan, of very powerful and wealthy people, including the mob bosses. Everybody lived in the same neighborhood. Everybody's related. It's all cousins, aunts, and uncles. And my mother had about 25 cousins who freaking guarded her chastity. She was expected to marry somebody in the families, and that would kind of strengthen the power of two families. Instead, she met my dad, fell in love with him, and nobody liked the asshole. And so, like he said, like had she gone to them and said, listen, this is what he's, how he's treating me, she knew he'd be dead, so she never did it. You know? Your dad's not even Italian. Swedish and German, I think is what he is. Yeah, they're not going to like the Swede no matter how good he is. You know what I mean? No. That's no. just not going to happen. So there's that. Something that kind of surprised me as we're getting into this, Al has a sister. Yeah, you kept parking on that. He didn't seem to want to talk about it. Um, yeah, and I don't want to get into the personal things, but uh, at this time, he's got a sister. She's older, like two years older, and... Uh, She's pretty popular. She's like, uh, I think she was even in beauty contests and things like that. And they got along really good. But in his young life, when he's moving around and getting from the grand, all, all, the, all the things that are happening, she's there. Yeah. yeah. But obviously when they were young, they were um, very close. Yes. They were friends and took care of each other. And he loves her and he still loves her. You know, it's, yeah. It's kind of like me and you. Uh, yeah. Except they're even closer. I'd say no. <laughs> Living in his grandparents' house is the beginning of a new life. He now lives in the desirable Gross Point neighborhood, where he has daily interactions with his underworld family. Okay, so at four, you go to your grandparents, mm. and that's pretty solid, right? Oh, yeah. Your, yeah. your grandparents are raising you. Now, this is like Italian family old school stuff. And the reason oh, Frank yeah. Sinatra wouldn't know about uh, Jack is because it's secretive. Like you said, there's no John yeah. Gotti. You know, there's no guy flashy in Detroit. There's not. I've been studying this, no. you know, ever since we met, and uh, it's a tough nut to crack. Yeah, you really can't blame Frank for that, because they're an enclave unto themselves, you know? Yeah, well, that's the way it's designed. Yeah, exactly. So you go to your grandparents. Other people live there, right? Don't you have an uncle that lives there still? Yeah, at home, my Uncle Pete, yeah. What's it like at your grandparents? Well, okay, so this is a strange dichotomy. I go straight into this beautiful big house in Gross Point. This house is today worth a million dollars, at least. It was given to my grandparents for $1 by the father-in-law. And that's a crazy story in itself. My grandpa, when he was coming over from Sicily, got on a, he was on a boat coming over here. And he met my grandmother. She was like 14 or 15. He was like 16, 17. He was headed for St. Louis. She was headed for Detroit. Her dad had a little bit of money, not much, but a little bit to start a business or something. And he fell in love with her on this boat. You know, it was a 10-day boat ride or whatever it was. And uh, he said, when I get to where I'm going... I'm going to come back and I'm going to find you and I'm going to marry you. Of course, my grandma's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And he was kind of a pauper. He was leaving Sicily to escape a mafia vendetta that had taken like all his cousins and uncles and stuff, just like in The Godfather. It's the same thing. Anyways, he goes to St. Louis where there's a very big mafia presence that's connected. In fact, Detroit called all the shots for the St. Louis mob. They were putting people in place. They decided who the boss was. They decided who the underboss was. It was Detroit. St. Louis was Detroit. Scott Bernstein, the, the expert, just told me that not long ago. And I said, well, that makes sense because I knew my grandpa went there and he had family there. So he joined the military. He did four years in the military, World War II. He was a medic. After that, he comes home from the military. He gets on a bus, goes to Detroit, tracks down my grandmother. Only I don't even think they stayed in contact. Maybe they wrote some letters. Yeah, they did. I, I remember that. But anyways, he goes to Detroit, finds her father, 
Pietro uh, Lido is his name, not Peter, Pietro. And he says, I'd like your, your daughter's hand in marriage. What you don't know is my grandpa spent his entire salary in the army one year, saved every dollar he had, the entire salary for a year, a modern day equivalent to about, I don't know, 35,000, 40, 40 grand, I imagine. And he bought this huge diamond ring, five carats, this blue diamond, you know, goes to the, my great grandfather, says, I want to marry your daughter. Can I have your permission? He says, yes. He marries her. They were married 64 years. So they have five kids. And so Pietro gave him, them a house. By the time he did that, Pietro had only been in business for five or six years. He started a construction company and he had a lot of money and a lot of credit. So he built them a house. And for the wedding gift said, here, here's a house for you and my daughter. Beautiful house, not a huge mansion or nothing, just a nice house in Gross Point. And it was where all the freaking mob bosses and all the capos and everybody involved in the family pretty much lived within about a two, three square mile radius. But the nucleus was like, well, all in a couple of blocks. We were kind of like on the outer edge of the nucleus. So living there, it was a very nice, beautiful setting. My grandparents were normal. It was very functional. You know, I, I got catered to like, like, like I was, you know, I was a little Italian kid. What do you think? Anything I wanted, they gave it to me. If even at this young age, Lynn Bloom begins to realize that his family is not like the other families. And you really don't have a sense of the mafia at that point, less than 14. Like, you don't, you don't realize what's going on, like that they're a founding crime family. No, I'm going to be honest. I, I did have an idea. I did even earlier than that, quite earlier than that. I mean, I'm talking six, seven, eight years old. Certain kids tell me that my mom said they can't hang around you because you're in the mafia or I heard my mother saying that you're in the mafia. We didn't know what the hell the mafia was, but I did know. I did understand. I was a smart kid. I've always been a smart guy. Something was different about my family. The way people treated us was different. And I pay attention, very observant. I was a super observant kid. For example, if I walked into a room, I'd notice that your finger had that big scar on it instantly because that's I noticed everything. And so I, I would watch and I could see we go down to the market, the Eastern Market, which is the little Italy of Detroit. And everybody knows that Eastern Market is mob central. They control like a one square mile of nothing but produce and fruit businesses and all, everything. All the fruit and produce and meats come there first and they get distributed. The mob owns it all. So my grandfather owned a produce business there. My uncle owned a produce business there. Some of my cousins did. So we were down there all the time. It was only about a five minute ride from our house at Girls Point, maybe 10, uh, whatever. And I was down there all the time because when my mom got sick, my grandmother would babysit, you know, because she still had to do the books and stuff. My grandpa retired when he was like 55, but my grandmother was still helping with the book. And he was a big bookie, big, huge bookie. My little old grandma, four foot nine grandma, would sit on this little freaking thing, typing away and, and make these coded ledgers, boxes them, box them. And they all, you know, who owes what, who lost what, who gets paid what, whatever. Because he, he had like 40 bookies. He's a layoff book, huge one, a master layoff book. He was connected to Vegas. So I would go down in the, the market and I would notice that everybody who saw my grandpa or my uncle would go, hey, P, how you doing, goodbye? And they shake his hand with two hands. Hey, how you doing, Paisa? Yeah, let me give you a freaking box of fruit. Let me give you some meat to take home to your mother or your wife, whatever. And they'd freaking give them stuff. Just give them. Everybody wanted to give us stuff all the time. You couldn't walk in there with cash to buy something. They wouldn't take your money. They'd like, here you go. And I'm saying, oh, you go to bring this home to your mom, Pete. Tell your mom I said hell. Or tell your dad I said hi. Here's some steaks or a roast or something. Take that. Always. And I noticed they didn't do that with other people. They didn't treat other people like that. And I noticed it. And I'm just like, well, what's the deal? And then the whole little, like I said, kids in the mob. And then there was things in the newspaper, you know. And, and like, it just, by the time I was nine or ten, I had a, I didn't know what the mafia was. I just knew that freaking these, some of these men that came around my house all the time. Tony Giacalone, Tony Corrado, and some of the other big names like Vincent Mele, Jimmy Q. They would come over. They'd pull up in their big Cadillacs, you know, and they'd come in for a cup of coffee. They'd talk in Sicilian. They never talked in English. they talk in Sicilian. they go in the back and talk. Then they hang out for a little while, maybe uh, on a Saturday for football games, college, you know, whatever. And then they leave. But they're always coming and going, always coming and going. And, I, you know, I'm outside playing. I'm looking at other houses and – other houses don't got guys in Cadillacs and big gold chains pulling up every freaking five minutes. Another thing was this. The FBI was surveilling our house one time, and this scene, this finds its way into a scene in my book, believe it or not. So I was out there playing in front of the house on my, with my Tonka toys, playing. And I look over, and there's some car, you know, sedan sitting there, and the guy's taking pictures. 
So I run to the backyard. My grandfather is pruning his tomatoes, just like the godfather. That's my grandfather was loves his tomatoes. We have so many tomatoes in the backyard because we make sugu, which is meat sauce. And so I said, Grandpa, Grandpa, there's a man taking pictures of me out front. Grandpa. And he, my grandpa comes walking out. He sees the car. He reaches down. He grabs a brick out of the freaking landscaping, like a landscape brick. And he runs up and he says, not my effing home. Not my effing home. And smashes the, the windshield with this freaking brick. It bounces off, goes flying, and they peel off. <laughs> not my effing home. You, know, you can watch me wherever, man. Don't come to my home. My, my freaking grandson's there playing. And that really, you know, irritated me. So I knew there, too, you know, there were issues. And there were other things. Somebody beat up my uncle real bad, my Uncle Sal. There was a, a sit-down, and it just so happened I was there. Like kind of eavesdropping, and they were talking about you know finding who the guy it was and killing him. And I, back then I could understand Sicilian pretty good. I can't remember what the crap now, but but back then because everybody spoke Sicilian all day every day, that I was able to understand. And I guess some dude cracked him with a crowbar. The particulars of, of why I won't get into because still there's a probably open cases. But at the end of the day, they're like, we're going to find this, this dude and kill him. And I'm Jesus. I'm like nine years old listening to this. They don't think I can understand because I'm nine years old and they're all speaking Sicilian. Like I said, by the time I'm 10, 11, 12, I had a pretty good idea that my family wasn't like everybody else. So he talks about some men that came around and uh, he talks about Tony Giacalone. He's a Detroit mobster who, with Anthony Provenzano, are believed to be the last people seen with Jimmy Hoffa. Right. Vincent Millay was a capo in the Detroit Partnership and an associate of Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Q, actually his name was uh, Raffaella Corasano, I think. Been serving as Jack Toko's concierge as he uh, he took that role over in like 1979. So these are big wigs in the Detroit mob that are coming around his house and being a part of his life. Right. And uh, a lot of people don't realize I actually lived in this part of Detroit for a few years. So this was my stomping ground, though. And it's kind of laid out like that. Like, Gross Point is a really nice area. There's uh, St. Clair Shores. It's gorgeous. When you're standing there, it looks like the ocean and stuff. And there's all these million-dollar houses. So where his grandparents live, it's good luck if you want to live there now, right? And then there's this thing called Down River. And I lived on an island called Gross Eel. I had a house there. And uh, there's this weird thing about when we first get there, they're like, well, you're going to live up at Gross Point, right? You're not going to live down river. You know, and the down river people, when I'd meet people there, they're like, well, you got to live down river. You don't want to live up there. They're kind of competitive about the geography of Detroit. It's really interesting. At the age of five, Al starts school and his tendency to find trouble begins to manifest. Dude, listen, I was the worst freaking raucous, rambunctious, bellicose kid. I had some mental issues too. I, they called me what back then is what they call the hyperkinetic. Today they call it ADD. But I, I they, back then they, they called it hyperkinetic and they put me on Ritalin. Nothing could slow me down. Here's the main reason. I, they kept testing my IQ because I couldn't focus on class. I'd always disrupt the class. I would always talk and flirt with girls and shoot spitwads and cause problems and getting fights. And they're like, what's his problem? Let's test his IQ. Is he slow? Is he stupid? And I, then I come back with this really high IQ every time. You know, it's just below genius. They're like, he's smart. He can do it. But he just chooses not to. And I had a deep dislike for bullies. I didn't like bullies. My very first day in kindergarten, Gross Point, when I, my parents divorced and I moved them to Gross Point, I started kindergarten. Actually, I think it was the second day. We had the kids, they give us building blocks. They're like two by fours and four by fours or whatever. Here's this kid, this big dumb kid who got held back a couple of classes. I mean, like meaning, he's like seven. He's still in kindergarten because he's a big dumb oaf, big dumb Italian. Luca Brasi is a freaking seven-year-old Luca Brasi. He's bullying all these freaking kids in there, taking their blocks, whatever. I'm watching this kid now. I'm just a skinny little wiry freaking kid. I get mad. I pick up a freaking two by four and I walk over and start clobbering this kid. In the head. I bust him in the head four or five times. He's screaming and crying. I get suspended. Second day in kindergarten, I'm suspended already. And so that's basically set the tone for the rest of my life in school. From this point, Lynn Bloom enjoys a relatively normal life. He will someday look back on this time period as one of the finest he ever has. It was a time of family and friends, and it was also a time of rudimentary wise guy education. So I did have two uncles that were living there. So my uncle Salvatore. He's about, I don't know, 15, 16 years older than me. And then my uncle Peter, Peter Paul Toko Jr., he was 12 years older. 
and he was a street guy. He was a bad guy. He was a you know hustler and hung around a bunch of bikers and wise guys. And so I kind of looked up to him and started wanting to emulate him when I was a kid. You know, he kind of he's the one who brought me into the life. He brought me in. He told me who was who, taught me the rules. You know, and then, and he would say to me, he's like, you know, you're you're a defetto. A defetto means a half breed. He's like, so you're never going to get made. You're never going to be a capo. He's like, but you are a toko, and and, and they're going to respect that. And so here's the rules. Who's who? Like, I remember I disrespected my uncle Nicky one time because the guy, he was a powerful, wise guy, capo. And he'd come around all the time when I was a little kid. I'm talking four or five years old, and he'd give me a $5 bill. Then he'd give me a $10 bill when I got a little older. Then he'd give me a 20 And then one day it was my birthday. I was probably eight, nine years old. And he gives me a 20 And my mom says, you know, it's his birthday today, right? And he said, what's your birthday? I'm like, I said, yeah, I'm not worth the hundo. Oh, I'm not worth a hundred dollars. I was just trying to work him, and he, he pulled out his knot, gave me a hundred bucks. My my uncle said, "What are you doing, man? You freaking shake this guy down? You know that's disrespectful." You know he you fronted him off. He said, "He's like, what do you expect him to do in front of the whole family? You don't want to look like an asshole." So he pulls a hundred dollars out and gives it to you. Uh, he's like, "Well, you don't do that, to Uncle Nicky. There's some people you you know you don't." Anyway, so I learned the rules of game from my uncle Pete, and then. You know, around age 14, he kind of started getting me involved in some little scams and racket stuff. And then, but yeah, that those years of my life were actually uh, the best years of my life. And I was just telling my wife yesterday or the day before that those years in Gross Point are what made me who I am today. My character, that neighborhood put me on this path and built the character I am today. All my character nuances come from those years living in that neighborhood around nothing but Dago kids. So yeah, those were good years of my life. My, my grandparents were really good to me. My Uncle Nick, he taught me how to play poker when I was um, about eight or nine. He got me and all my cousins together, right? Went my grandparents' house in Gross Point, they had this big dining room table with a big chandelier over the top. Gets all these kids together, puts that table, he's like, listen, everybody gets 100 pennies. I'm gonna teach you how to play poker. So we all get 100 pennies. It must have been seven or eight of us kids, you know? And even the girls were there and he, give us all pennies and he's teaching us the hands you know what's a winning hand and why and how to play and, you know we're smart young kids so we get it pretty quick he's like i'm gonna cut every pot right so as the house you know i'm, I'm entitled to whatever it was you know cutting every te- cut 10 percent of every pot so if there's uh 10 pennies was the pot you keep a penny whatever so we play for like two or three hours and we love it you know we're learning how to play and we're all laughing you know trying to bluff whatever in the end my cousin anthony he wins the whole pot you get basically we I bet all in i think i got a good hand but i don't and then anthony wins a winning hand boom he takes it all and we're all like oh man you know anthony what he said he said who's the big winner today my uncle nick who's the big winner this is my this is my grandmother's brother by the way and uh we're like oh anthony's the big winner and he's like no he's like anthony's not the big winner look at what i got in front of me so he shows us there's a big pile of pennies in front of him he's like i didn't play a hand and i got freaking more more pennies than anthony's got He's like, gambling is for suckers. If you're going to gamble, you beat a house. You never not beat a house. You always house. Gambling is for suckers. They instilled that in my brain. And so later on, Tony Giacalone taught me three dice. It was, I mean, I just took I took so much money from people playing three dice. And they're just too stupid to figure out if they take all bets as the house, then you could clean everybody out. By the time he turns 10, his mother feels ready to reestablish their independence and moves the two of them out of the upscale Gross Point home. To the outside world, things seemed to be getting on track for the Lindblom family. On the inside, however, it was a much different picture. When I was like 10, and uh, I moved uh, from my grandparents' house to this little place in Clinton Township, a little shack, and my mother worked part-time as a substitute school teacher, and we did okay, but my mother was still mentally ill. Nobody knew how bad she was. She didn't clean the house. She didn't do laundry. She didn't clean the bathroom. She barely cooked, never did the dishes, yada, yada, yada. I was just a wild child. I hung around these guys. It was right on Lake St. Clair, and all I wanted to do was go fishing. Every day, I just leave and go fishing. I might not come home for freaking 10 hours. Are you glad to be out of the grandparents' house? No, not at all. I would have rather stayed at my grandparents' house. Um, that's where I grew up. That's my neighborhood. That's all my friends and cousins and aunts and uncles. They're all there. But, I mean, I was kind of like, in one way, proud that my mother was able to get us out on her own, so she felt... Like, you know, she could be on her own. But it didn't last. It lasted a few years. She kept having nervous breakdowns, going to a mental institution. With his mother struggling against her emotional and mental issues, it's difficult for her to provide the kind of life she has always wanted for her son. Al finds himself restless and unattended. 
I had no supervision, so I acted like a freaking maniac all the time. And it was a, those were fun years of my life because, like I said, we lived right across the street from Lake St. Clair, and all my friends lived like right on the lake. We all lived, there. so we go fishing every day. We go out on the boats fishing, and we there's little patches of woods around, and we we go hunting with our BB guns in the woods all day, shoot our bows and arrows. It was like I was Huck Finn for three years. I fell in love with this stuff. So I mean, that's the reason why to this day I'm a huge hunter and fisherman. Uh, because of those little three years. Although he's enjoying the freedom and the companionship of his neighborhood friends, he's also acutely aware that things with his mother are getting progressively worse. Until one day, it all comes apart. Right at the time my mother went into an institution, which is crazy, nobody knew she was in the institution except me and my sister. She walked all the way to my dad's house on barefoot, which is like seven miles away. And she was pacing back and forth, just talking crazy. The cops came. She fought with them. They ended up, like, tackling her and cuffing her. She ended up in a freaking crazy house. Well, we didn't tell my grandparents. We didn't tell anybody. We didn't want to go anywhere because, you know, now we've been living here for three years, and our friends are here, and we basically took care of ourselves anyways. So we wanted to stay, and my grandparents never came to our house, this crappy little shack that we rented. It was a house that was divided into three units, just tiny, two bedrooms, a little tiny living room and kitchen, and it was filthy, filthy. But, you know, we liked it there, so we didn't want anyone to know. We were ashamed. We wouldn't even come look at the house. It was disgusting. The family's not giving her any money? She wouldn't ask. So that's the problem. She wouldn't take it. My mother wouldn't take it. She said, we're good. Everything's good. I'm making the most money. I got you. Exactly. They don't go there. We go to their house every Sunday. We go to their house, have dinner every Sunday. Uh, they send us home with some food and some produce, you know, because my grandpa had all the you know, produce business. So we always had boxes of fruit, bananas, whatever. So he sent us home, and, and we go back, and then come back Sunday, and everything was fine. Every Sunday, you know, they never knew. They never came to our little crappy shack. Why would they? You know what I'm saying? They, we go to their big house in Girls Point for dinner every Sunday. With the Lynn Bloom siblings flying under the radar, it isn't long before his dysfunctional home life bleeds over into his school life. Eventually, I got expelled from school because I beat up a bully right in front of my principal. I had been suspended. I'm not exaggerating. I think it was 10 times. Some of them were in-house suspensions where they put me in this, like, closet type of room and just give me my homework and say, stay in there and do your homework all day, which I hated. I just couldn't do it. I was a nightmare. I, I, I tried, it was like being in prison. That was my precursor to prison. They stick me in a prison cell, basically, smaller than a cell, with a desk, and here's your homework. Go work. Because I had acted a fool in class, and I don't even remember why. I do remember some of them were expensive for fighting. But one time, there was this kid named Bruce the Moose. Big kid. Big, uh, harmless, big, goofy kid, right? We called him Bruce the Moose because he was a big guy, Moose. So he's at the drinking fountain, and he's drinking some water, and this kid, a new kid named Bill Plunkett, comes walking, a good-looking kid, kind of cocky. He comes walking by, and wham, he slams Bruce the Moose off the freaking drinking fountain, right? He's going to knock his teeth out, you know what I'm saying? Kid bangs his head. He looks back like, man, what's wrong with you? Whatever. I snap, black out, and I walk up, and the dude's got a, a pencils, a thing of pencils in his hand, you know, with like 12 dozen pencils. And I walk up, and I, bam, I grab the pencils out of his hand, and I go, crack, I snap him over my knee and go, and throw him in his face, puff. And they all, I said, what you want to do? You want to pick on somebody, man? Pick on me, punk-ass bitch. He don't say nothing. I'm like, that's what I thought. I turn around, I walk away. Just as I turn to rock away, he jumps on my back like a monkey. And I freaking just like, ah, I slammed him over my back. Wham, 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 wham. Just wailing on him. It seems that Lynn Bloom has finally gotten in one school altercation too many. And by the eighth grade, the days of parentless living are about to end. Well, my principal, Mr. Johnson, Peg Leg Johnson, he comes, he was right there. So he saw the whole thing. So he basically said, enough is enough. I'm expelling him from the district. We don't want him back. You know, and they tried to get a hold of my mother, and they couldn't. They found out my mother was in the hospital, and I got nobody at home to, to supervise me. So they called my father, and they're like, you know, you got to take him. So my dad had to take him. So I moved my freaking dad, my alcoholic freaking tightwad dad. And uh, at that point, I was like 14. I was in eighth grade. It was, a, I, was, um, I, was I was only like 10 weeks in my first eighth grade. And so then I moved with my dad, and th that was freaking kind of a nightmare. Not surprisingly, and despite his higher than average IQ, Al doesn't meet the requirements to move on to the ninth grade and is forced to repeat. From here, it seems that things continue on their collision course. So I, I, I go to eighth grade. I'm really, I make a few friends. Of course, I migrate towards, you know, Italian kids. So my best friend, Jay Battaglia, 
who's the inspiration for Vani in my book, my book, Vani Battaglia. Uh, real good looking, tough guy, handsome kid, slick. All the girls loved him. He was my best friend. And I was his wingman. And of course, some other Italian friends. And I had a couple other friends that weren't Italian too. But, you know, naturally the, the culture, you migrate towards them. And so I had that bad year where I didn't do nothing. I was in constantly in trouble, constantly spending. I caught my first case. It was destruction of property. This douchebag friend of mine, freaking, we had a little crew called Brookie Boys because the street neighbor named Brooklyn. So I don't even know why we just started calling ourselves Brookie Boys. The Beastie Boys were out at the time, so he was like Brookie Boys, Beastie Boys. And he was he was a he was a spray painter, you know, graffitiist, you know. And he's while I was up north camping with my dad one weekend. That's one thing my dad did do. We take me camping all the time, so I thank him for that. So this kid, Ricky, he ends up tagging all these schools while I'm out camping. Like, he gets caught, and witnesses see him. They know who he is. Yeah, he spray paints all over these freaking walls our initials. Rookie boys with our initial. And they have beautiful art, but when a dumbass puts their freaking name on there. I, I all of a sudden, now I get arrested and charged with this. And I'm like, I didn't paint shit. And it was, you know, but I won't rat Ricky out. You see what I'm saying? I said, no witnesses saw me paint nothing. They're like, well, your initial AL's there. I'm like, that don't mean dick. I don't mean I did it. Well, who did it? I'm like, I don't know. I was camping with my dad. Did anyone see me? Did they pick me out? Didn't matter. They still charged me with it. So my dad had to pay, I don't know, man, like seven or 800 bucks for the sand, the, the help, the cleanup. And I went to the youth home for like a weekend and I got put on probation. So now this is what I'll tell you how I got expelled from school. They, they, you know, you're in eighth grade and they had these bands come to your school and they play a band, you know, and the kids in the, in the, in the auditorium there. And so there was this rock and roll band. I didn't like rock and roll all that much. But I actually listened to rap, believe it or not. And that's what I liked. You know, I grew up on it. So I did, but I liked the musical part, not gangster rap. But that's something that's okay, too. You know, everybody likes whatever. But I didn't like this hard rock, a bunch of long hair dudes thrashing out with guitars. I'm like, this is lame. And then they pull out a freaking T-shirts and, and like Frisbees and stuff. And they start throwing it into the crowd, right? And he, I see a football. There's, you ever see the dog that when you show him the ball, he just freaks out because all he wants to do is play the ball? That's how I felt about football. I was very, very good at football. That's something that I should put on the record, is I was exceptional athlete. Like, I excelled at every single sport. Anyways, so they, 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 they had this concert. The guy pulls out a Nerf football, and I'm like, oh, over here, over here. He's not looking at me, over here. Finally, he, like, throws it into the crowd, and he throws it over, like, maybe six, eight feet, down a couple rows. Well, I dive over everybody. I'm in the back row with my little crew. I got a little crew of guys all around me, and I just dive over. And when I catch the football, of course, but when in the process of catching the football, I need some girl on the side of the head, like in the, right in the ear, and, and hurt a couple people. Elbow one person, knee another person. I got the ball again. Yeah! My boys are laughing. They're like, this freaking dude is crazy. I just dove over the crowd and, like, smashed the big crowd of people just to get this ball. Well, principal sees me he's like they're still playing the concert he looks at me and goes come here so i come down there and like he's like go in the hallway so i go in the freaking hallway and it's our assistant principal dude named kuznia this half asian dude with a fu manchu goatee he, everybody thinks he knows karate and stuff i walk out there and he goes what the f is wrong with you Bam! and he punches me punches me in the face Bam! not crazy hard just jazzy bam and i said mother i said you can't you can't punch me Bam! i punch him back you know, and I jump back ready to fight. I'm like, you ain't my dad, bro. You can't just hit me, man. So anyway, he's like, get out of here. Go home. So I leave. We get the call. I'm expelled. Um, that's it. They kicked me out of school. Kicked out of school, Lynn Bloom is turned loose on the local neighborhoods and forced to scratch a living in ways that come all too naturally to the budding gangster. So I get kicked out of school. Everybody good is in school. Everybody bad is out of school. You know, the rejects and the freaking the morons and the losers and the dropouts and whatever. What do you think they're doing? They're all using drugs. They're all stealing and robbing. They're all up to, you know, street stuff, gangster stuff. So naturally, I I have a moped and, you know, I put on this, my, my troop jacket, my big gold chain, drive around the neighborhood, go all to the freaking losers' houses every day. You need a bag? You need some coke? You need this? You need that? Oh, you got this to sell and that to sell? I know a guy who wants that. Let me get this. And that's all I'm doing in the neighborhood, just riding around all day on my moped. Flipping, selling weed, selling dope. So that's the crazy story how he even got put in the weed game with the crazy. My dad wasn't buying food. He was just, I'd be starving all the time. Dad, you know, he had food in there for himself. I'm like, can I have that? I'm hungry. He's like, no, that's mine. Like, There's nothing to freaking eat here. He's like, uh, eat a freaking cracker. I finally got sick of it. I went to the freaking weed man's house where we got weed. 
I asked him to front me some weed so I can make some money. I need I need food. That's what I told him. I'm starving, literally. So he fronts me a quarter pound. I sell it in a day. Bring him his money. He gives me a pound. I start pumping. I end up getting a bunch of guys selling weed for me. So now I'm in the neighborhood hustling. Now I got money. The first day that I, I sold that quarter pound, I made like 350 bucks. I bought all groceries. Went to the grocery store on my moped. Had groceries on my moped. Brought them back, put in the fridge. My dad's like, what's all this food? I'm like, it's mine. Don't touch. Same thing you told me. Don't touch my food. You know, and that, that bothered him. So fast forward, I'm on the street all the time. All I do is hang around scumbags for the most part. You know, obviously I was moving in the wrong direction. The school, even though I know I failed eighth grade again, they're like, we don't want them. The middle school said, we don't want them back. So we're just going to send them up to the freaking the high school and let them deal. With them. So they pushed me off to the high school. So I go to the high school and um, dude, like I said, I, at this time, I, you know, I must have thought I was a rapper, but I was a typical little young wise guy. I wore like feel a track suits, you know, gold chain, beeper, hat backward. I look like, you know, whatever. I look like a typical little Italian kid. And that's the style that I saw my uncles wearing growing up and I wanted to emulate them. Although it wasn't like a popular style in this neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? I'm still me from the old neighborhood, from the Gross Point neighborhood. And I'm bringing the style to this new neighborhood. This is who I was. I wasn't going to change. So I kind of was like an outcast. They saw me as like a little thug or a little wigger or whatever. They saw me where I was just, you know, different than them. I dressed different. I acted different. Carried myself different. Predictably, his freshman year of high school is fraught with stolen property, drugs, and the occasional fight. It's not long before Lindblom finds himself facing expulsion for the final time. So I go start hanging around this freaking kid, Ricky. He's a freaking scumbag, man. He's a thieving, lying, thieving, scumbag kid, but he's a good-looking kid, and all the girls like him. So a lot of girls like him, and Ricky's always into something. Ricky always has weed. Ricky always has a party. Ricky always has some girls' house to go over to. You know, he dresses real nice, so he got the flyest new gear. You know, So I hang around the kid. He's a thief. He's always breaking into houses, stealing crap. What happened? I got suspended for a couple of fights in the, in the school that year. Like, I remember one fight was in the cafeteria. And some older kid freaking like tried to say I couldn't sit at this table. And I said, F you. And he said, F you. And he like freaking grabbed me like he's going to throw me off. And I just swung out him and started fighting right in the middle of the cafeteria. So I got suspended. But I hadn't been there very long, like six or eight weeks. And um, eventually, this kid, Ricky, what he was doing was breaking in lockers, stealing stuff. Now, I was the weed man. I sold weed. So he'd take stuff that he'd stolen. And if you couldn't get money or weed for it, he'd come to me. You want to buy this? You want to buy that? You know, this little stuff, gold chains and freaking, you know, anything kind of jewelry you could find, maybe like a Walkman or whatever. And um, so he comes to me, and he's my boy, but I didn't trust him worth the crap. I knew he was a scumbag. I suspected he actually stole my moped, I, I, but I couldn't prove it, so I just knew it was him. And he stole my dad's gun, too. I had showed him my dad's pistol where he keeps it next to his bed in this little thing. And then my dad asked me, where's my gun? I'm like, what are you talking about? His gun's missing. So a gun came up missing. I know it was his scumbag ass too. And I couldn't do nothing, man. Um, I regret not smashing his face in. I do. It's one of the things I regret. But anyways, he's stealing these lockers. The way the lockers work, when you shut your lock, you spin the lock to make it lock. Well, Ricky would go down the hall and spin them backwards. If you spin them back to the right at the right spot, just go slow and go click, and you go, choom, open the lock. And that's how he's getting in. So he's stealing all these freaking coats and crap. So one day he comes over to my house, he's got this nice black leather coat. I like it. It's a beautiful leather coat. Give me 50 bucks for the, the coat or a quarter. I'm like, man, whose coat is it, man? Where'd you get it? He's like, it's my brother Frank's. I'm like, you, you sure this is my, your brother's? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, this is my brother's. It don't fit him no more. He gave it to me. I don't want it. I got a couple coats. Give me 50 bucks. So, all right, so I grabbed the coat. I buy the coat, freaking wear it to school the next day because it was a badass leather coat, real popular brand. The kid who he stole it from sees me wearing his coat, goes to the school cop, reports it. They freaking end up arresting me and suspended me. And basically, long story short, is they expelled me from school indefinitely. And they said, we don't want him back. And they asked me, where'd you get it? And I wouldn't tell where I got it. I wouldn't tell on Ricky. That's that, that kind of guy I was, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't going to freaking rat Ricky out. I should have, but I didn't. My grandfather, like I said, this is the first time I ever saw my grandpa try to kind of flex his his, his might, if you will, his uh, you know name. And we went to a board meeting with uh, the, the school superintendent and the principal and the school cop and blah, 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 blah. And it was him and my mother, my grandfather and my mother and all these people. 
And my grandfather come in and sit down. He's like, my name's Peter Paul Toko. Do you know who I am? And they, and they said, yeah, Mr. Toko, we know who you are. And he, he sits down and says, okay, I want my grandson to stay in school. I want him to finish school. And they're like, I'm sorry, Mr. Toko, but, you know, he's not welcome here. He just, he's, just, he's just trouble, man. He's he's just, he's been in a bunch of fights. He comes to school every morning reeking like pot. He freaking, you know, he's involved with this stolen merchandise. We don't want him. And he's like, but I, I want him to stay in this school. Who is this guy? This is the superintendent of the entire school district. So the top dog, and he's he's saying this to my grandpa. He's got some stones because he did not sign up for this shit. You know he must have been freaking like, I got to strap my nuts on for this one. Man, he and I are different kind of guys. Uh, you'd be back right. in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, me too, if I would have been him. But the guy was pretty adamant. I mean, I'm sure he had a meeting with all these people, the school cops and everybody else, and they were just like, this kid's a rotten apple, man. He ain't never going to make it. All he's going to do is get, get fights and suspended and stealing. He's a, he's a freaking scumbag. He's, in, he's cut out. He's going to prison. That's where he's going to go. So they didn't want me, and they stuck to it. You know, that, that's the end of it. So I was 15 years old. They kicked me out indefinitely. Yeah. Oh, my. Listen to this sentence. With a record of school behavior so bad that even intimidation from the mob couldn't save him, Alan Gunner Lindblom has nowhere to turn but the street life that seems to have been calling him since the day he was born. And um, and that is when I kind of took up a full-time life of crime, you know, because all I knew at this point, the only friends I had were dropouts, l- losers, and drug addicts, and thieves, and scumbags. You know, there's tons of them in the neighborhood. The whole, anyway, I live in St. Clair Shores, which is a very big, populous, like, lower middle-class suburb. And then I had all my cousins... My cousins and his family was in Gross Point, which is connected to St. Clair Shores. So I like had two different worlds. I had my Gross Point family and cousins, and, everything, and then I had my St. Clair Shores friends. And, and I just got involved in everything, man. I ended up having a bike chop shop, tons of stuff. It's around this time that he experiences his first introduction to real organized crime. I probably should tell you how I first got involved in organized crime to begin with. This is a really funny story. I, I, you probably read it. I'll, I'll make it brief. But my uncle, some guy owed my uncle like 20 grand. He is managing this very high-end restaurant. And so he would send me in there to get a sinecure check. So basically the guy was saying I worked there, but I didn't. And he was taking 350 bucks a week on a payroll and then using it to pay me. I said I was a baker. I was 15 years old and I bring my uncle the check and he'd give me 50 bucks. That's all I had to do is walk in there, get the check and 50 bucks. This is great. I love this job. You know what I'm saying? And that, then what happened was I ended up seeing the guy had some perch in there and I, and they looked like silver bass and we could catch a million silver bass. And I looked at him, I said, man, Dude, how much you paying for those perch? He's like, you know, two fifty a pound. I'm like, bro, I'll sell you silver bass for freaking a dollar fifty a pound. You make a buck a pound. You sell like a thousand pounds a week. I'm not joking. This restaurant sold like a thousand pounds a week of this stuff. Not, not even exaggerating. That was their specialty. It was a high end restaurant right on Lake St. Clair. People would come from miles to eat their perch. I said, you know, so they're going through a thousand pounds a week. I said, I can't give you a thousand pounds a week, but I get you five hundred pounds on a good week. He said, oh, we'll try it. We've sent it out, and people ate it, and they're like, oh, delicious. Nobody knew the difference. It looked just like perch plate. So me and my friends could go out on the boat, and if the conditions were right, you could see the seagulls diving in the water, and they're going after the middles. The silver bass are going after the middles. So there's freaking fish jumping all over. So we could run and catch them on the boat, little boat with an outboard motor, and we would catch. No, not joking, maybe 500 of these fish in a day. We'd follow the school for like four hours. They'd pop, it'd pop up over there, we'd get over there, and then it'd disappear for 20 minutes. And bam, it'd pop up over there, and we'd just follow it, follow it. Until we filled the boat up. Then we'd take it to Samson Fish Market and pay them a 30 cents a pound to fillet them. And they would fillet them, and they, they would sell them too if you sold them to them as lake perch. Not yellow perch, lake perch. People are stupid, they don't know the difference. So we were selling it to this guy. So anyway, that guy ended up getting busted, doing the same thing, buying uh, buying fish from an unlicensed guy, and he got busted. But, you know, let's say I did him 500 pounds a week, and he saves 500 bucks. That's 500 bucks that goes to my uncle. I was making about a buck a pound on it. Me and my boys, you know, the cost for it was like, you know, nothing. So anyways, 
that was my first. So my uncle got me involved in that. It was a good story when you said, like, after he got busted, this guy was Harry, right? Yeah. Was he a Coke dealer that owned the, owned the restaurant? That you went to court. Tell that. You went to court and made sure he didn't talk about you. Yeah, no, Harry was the guy's name. The Coke dealer was the guy who owned the place. That's, I would later learn that. I didn't know, but the guy who owned the place, I probably shouldn't even say his name, but I don't care. His name was Bobby Moore. Some big shot baller, huge cocaine freaking kingpin, but I didn't know this at the time. In fact, if you ever watch the movie uh, White Boy Rick, um, White Boy Rick's plug in the movie was Art Derrick. Well, Art Derrick and Bobby Moore were 50-50 partners. They had their own Learjet. You know, and it's crazy how they got, they got busted, too. But that's the guy who owned the place. And he was in Miami all the time because he had a restaurant in, in Miami. And that's how Harry was putting me on the books. And the girl who did the, the paperwork and the management, she didn't know I didn't work there. He just said, you know, this is the guy. He had somebody punch me in and punch me out, whatever. And um, so, yeah, after the Harry got busted, we got word of it real quick. And then so my uncle says, listen, you're going to go to court and show up in the back and let him know you see him. You don't want to make sure he doesn't say anything about us. I mean, it wasn't really that big of a deal. It was just some freaking fake perch. But I didn't, you know, the guy could be ratting. He did owe my uncle a bunch of money for coke and freaking uh, and gambling. So I went in the back. I walked in. He saw me right away. He kind of nods at me. I sat in the back and listened to his arraignment. And um, he pled not guilty and whatever. So we wanted to make sure he knew that we were, you know, we knew he'd been busted and that uh, keep our name out your mouth. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Yeah, it was a good lesson. It really a generous lesson because there's guys that would just kill and not care. Yeah, that ain't Detroit. They wouldn't kill a guy over something like that. That wouldn't, you know, Detroit is not a murder happy city. They're not going to kill a guy over something minor like that. He doesn't really have nothing really that, that, that my grand uncle was selling him coke and then lending him money to buy the coke. So that's how he got him on the books, you know, and plus he gambled. So it was all a kind of a thing, but I said, dude, uh, you know, yeah, he, he had that kind of information, but I don't think it was enough to freaking like pose a threat. And plus the guy, didn't, I'm a total idiot, you know what I mean? would tell, but anyway, my uncle, when I told him I wanted this mini bike and this is kind of how, this is where it really begins, the organized crime and stuff. I said, I said we're on my way to grandparents for, for Sunday dinner. And I see this mini bike, it's on the side of the road, it says 90 bucks. I see it, I saw it was there last weekend, still there. So I tell my uncle, who's got a freaking brand new Cadillac, and he got a you know big gold chain, pocket full of money. Uh, you know, he's always got girls around, all these different girls. He takes me to the market with him all the time. He likes me like a sidekick. I don't know if you know if you if you ever, if you know Phil Leonetti's story. That basically the same sad story, or where um, Nicky Scarpa, uh, Nicky Scarpa was um, Phil Leonetti's uncle, and they'd bring him around. And that was me. I was the Phil Leonetti. So I looked up to my uncle, who was only 12 years older than me, by the way. So he was kind of an older brother, more than an uncle. So I say, Uncle Pete, man, dude, buy me this freaking mini bike, man. Come on, man, I want to get this mini bike. I just wanted that mini bike so bad. He said, man, I'm not buying you no F a mini bike, man. He's like, but I'll tell you how to get it. I said, well, how? He said, go get one of those Jerry Lewis cans. Cans, you know, you can shake. Would you like to donate to Jerry Lewis, you know, muscular dystrophy? Stand in front of the store, get that money, dump it out, put it in your pocket, go with the mini bike. So I tried it. I only made like 12 bucks, but I knew there was this big Kmart, which is like a, like a Myers, the Myers of its time. It was like, I knew where it was, like seven miles away. Now keep in mind, I'm 12 years old, so I jump on my bike and ride seven miles in one direction on main roads, no sidewalks, some of them, get to this Kmart and stand out there jingling this can. If you like to donate muscular dystrophy, help Jerry's kids, and they would stuff money in there, stuff money in. I stayed there all day. I unloaded that can five times into a bag, tied it to my handlebars, drove back home. So my mom never knew I was gone. Got home, dumped it out, counted 140 bucks. So I turned like $12 in, kept the rest, called my dad, said, will you take me to buy this mini bike? You know, I got the money. He, I don't think he asked where I got it. I think if he did, I just said my uncle or somebody. It takes me, I get the mini bike. I love my mini bike. I think it was awesome. I got all kinds of trouble with it. And cops freaking walking me home all the time because I get caught ripping down the sidewalk 30 miles an hour. But then the other thing, so now he's, you see what I'm going here is this is somebody I look up to, somebody I admire, somebody I, I aspire to be like. And he's saying, hey, man, this gray area, this scumbaggy move, it's okay. Do it. It's how we work. This is what we do. We cut corners. We find a way. We take advantage. We do whatever. The next one was oh, I had I wanted this bike. I was into freestyling on the bike doing the tricks. I wanted this bike real bad. Three hundred dollar bike. My mom said I'd get a hundred bucks for my bike for birthday. Three and so I'm like, the bike I want is three hundred. You wanted a Haro, right? I remember that bike. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted this Haro Master, couldn't afford it. 
So I told my uncle, come on, man, buy me this freaking bike. I know you got the freaking money. I see the money in your pocket all the time. He's like, I'm not buying you a freaking bike. Listen, go get your cousin Frankie. He lives around the corner. I'm not going to say his last name. He's doing life uh, for quadruple murder. Frankie's nuts. Yeah, I know. I know he's nuts. Frankie is nuts. Yeah, he was nuts. But anyways, he he go get Frankie. So go get Frankie. Comes back over and, and my uncle Pete says, Frankie, listen, go up to Gross Point South, steal Alonzo's bike. He'll give you fifty bucks. Frankie's like, yeah, no problem. That's easy. So like the next day or two, whatever it was, a couple of days. In fact, you know, I came over to my grandparents every Sunday. So that's when it was on like a Sunday. Or actually, not Sunday. We go there every weekend. We would go there like Friday night and we leave Sunday night. So we'd spend like two days there. And I loved it. I loved being at my grandparents. You know, food and catered to you, or your aunts. Oh, my aunts, my mom, my grandma, everybody. Anything you wanted, food, whatever. Just you're catered to. Anyways, he tells that to Frankie. I come back the next week. Frankie's got the bike. I give him 50 bucks. I get to keep 50 bucks and I got my freaking badass Haro. So this is kind of the introduction into this crime life that I'm, you know, and it doesn't sound like much of a big deal, but I mean, then, okay, keep in mind, that was when I was like maybe 13 or 14. For next year, it's like in 14, I start selling weed when I, because I was starving. Then and that, and that next year, I get expelled from school. So now I'm dabbling in selling Coke because that's what the freaking junkies in the neighborhood want. They want Coke. I'm using mini thins. I'm crushing up mini thins with freaking an eight ball and like, you know, doubling my Coke. And bring it to these freaking guys, and they snort it up, and they call me all day, and I run over and sell to them. I get a beeper. I thought I was a real big drug dealer, man. I had a beeper, and I would freaking, you know, I go to these, you know, run around on my moped, sell. And then I started expanding into weed. But then my my uncle, here's when it happens. With his first real scam behind him, Gunner ups his game in the narcotics distribution business. He's dealing relatively small quantities. That is until a chance interaction with his uncle opens a new opportunity. I went to my grandparents for Sunday dinner. I was wearing this leather, not a troop jacket, but it was a, a man alive jacket, like a pellet. And I had a bag of weed sitting in a zipper on the, on the front chest there. I didn't zip it shut. I also had a lot of money in there. I had like maybe 500 bucks in there, you know, just sitting in there with a bag of weed. This is like my own personal bag of weed too. And, you know, it's just sitting there hanging off the chair in, in the kitchen. So all of a sudden my uncle, he says, Alonzo, basement. Go in the basement. I'm walking down the basement. He pulls it out of the bag. He's like, what's this? And I'm like, oh, no, my heart drops. You get the chills. I'm like, oh, no, I'm in trouble, you know, drugs. Because you always taught that drugs are horrible. Drugs are bad. Grandma and grandpa are always talking about drugs. My Uncle Pete had got busted with coke uh, around that time, and they just bitched him out and were mean to him for, like, nine months. They were just freaking on him all the time because he got busted selling coke. And now my uncle's catching me with the weed, and he says, Come here. What's this? I said, freaking, what do you think it is, man? What? what? I said, like, you want to go tell grandpa now? And he's like, how much you pay for this? I'm like, ah, a couple, I don't know, 25 bucks. What, what is it, like an eighth of weed. He opens it. He smells it. He says, this is bullshit weed, man. He's like, what are you doing with it? I'm like, I'm selling it. Make money. Make a buck. Bu That's when he starts saying, well, if you're going to sell And then he says, listen, come here. So he gives me my bag. He throws it at me. I catch it, wrap it up. I'm like, he said, come on. So we go upstairs, the house had an attached garage. We go up in the freaking the garage and in the corner is a bunch of like banana boxes. But those boxes were always freaking there because my grandpa always had tons of like produce and, you know, fruit and crap. Lots of stuff that maybe that were damaged or whatever. He'd take it home and he'd give it to all his goombatis. So I just assumed that's what the, all that crap was. And he freaking comes over here and he freaking opens up a box and he says, here, take some of this. There's pounds of weed, pounds of it, a good weed, like much better. It wasn't like compressed Mexican weed. This is better weed. He said, if you're going to sell weed, sell the good freaking weed, man. You know what I'm saying? Here, take it for this much, X, blah, blah, blah. And he was, the price was pretty high, but it wasn't that bad to where I couldn't make a bunch of money. So now I'm, I go home every week with a freaking, you know, pound or two, and I start bagging it up. And, and before you know it, I got so much freaking traffic at my house to buy weed that it gets to the point where I can't, I can't do it, man. It's too much traffic. I mean, high school got out at 255 and at three o'clock on a dock, there'd be nine cars parked out in front of my house and people walking up to the house, counting money. And so it just, it's, it is a suburb, you know, this is a suburb of Detroit, it's a nice area. And I, and I got mad one day and I smacked the dude and I said, man, what the F is wrong with you, man? He used to ask me, my neighbor's outside working in his flower garden in front of the house. He's like, yo, He's like, I'll take an eighth of it. I'll pay four bucks for the, for tomorrow. I'm about, I smack him. I said, bro, you retarded, man. I'm freaking neighbor's right there, man. 
And so what I did was I kind of extorted these little thugs in my neighborhood, these little wannabe gangsters. There's a, you know, a bunch of little punks in the neighborhood. You know the kind. Every neighborhood's got a bunch of them. They think they're tough. They think they're gangsters. They think they're, you know. And anyway, so I, I called the meeting, and I, they were terrified of me. They're just terrified. I mean, I'm talking so terrified of me that if I scratched my head around them, they'd flinch. You know what I'm saying? That's all terrifying. And I called them and said, listen, meet me out here in this day. And then they all like freaking out. Like, oh no, what does freaking L want? Big bad L. So I get them down there. I go in the basement and I said, here's a quarter pound. Here's a quarter pound. Here's a quarter pound. Here's a quarter pound. Listen, I also actually got them beepers too. And here's a beeper. Here's your number. Pass out your cards. I said, anyway, now these guys aren't saying a freaking word to me either. They're, I didn't say nothing, but here, quarter pound each. I'm going to give it to you now, which was a Friday. I said, next Friday, we'll meet back here. You'll pay me. I'll give you another quarter pound. This is what I want. $900 per quarter pound on the front, which is outrageous. You know what I'm saying? Just rape them. They, so they can make 160 bucks if they sold it at full price. I'm just, But they were too scared of me to say no. So they started selling my weed for me. And, um, and they thought they liked it because they could make a couple hundred bucks. And they got free weed to smoke. And they, they got to act like they were drug dealers. You know, they got to say they were freaking, you know, one of Al's drug dealers. So they were just, you know, they thought they were cool. Like, they never come out and say that. But everybody be like, you know, I'm selling weed for Al, blah, blah, blah. So then, now they got muscle. They feel like they can. This is when they start getting tough. They start acting like they're really hard now because they got me backing them up. Yeah, one of them ended up getting pretty industrious, and he would flip my weed so fast. He got a plug in southwest Detroit. He was Mexican, take my weed, and he'd take the money, he'd flip it in two, three days, and then he'd go to get his own plug, and he would go down and get like a half pound for like, you know, 700 bucks, 800 bucks. And then he'd take that. So he kept selling my weed, but, but, he, but he was also selling his own weed, and he never told me. But I eventually, at one point, I told him, you know, I know what you're doing, bro. Freaking, I don't really care as long as you keep selling mine. But on the other hand, you could be selling more of mine. But he's, you know, he's making way more money. So I respected that. I was like, whatever. I ended up, I almost freaking robbed him. Like one time, I was going to, I was going to get him. I told him, give me a couple pounds. I want to see it. If the weed wasn't garbage, I would have freaking just knocked him out and took it. Cause I didn't really like the kid. You know, he, he was all right. Now he became one of my best friends down the road. And then, um, then he, supported me in prison for freaking like 10 years and then he had like a mental breakdown and, and I got really super weird and I don't know what happened to him I haven't talked to him since I've been home one time but but anyway so that's what I was doing at age 15 16 and by then then I started like clocking pretty good money you know depending on how you look at it um you know up to a couple thousand a week and plus I started selling steroids so I got involved in a steroid racket and that was good. And then I was doing um, the flipping stolen merchandise because by now everybody's bringing all the thieves in the neighborhood are bringing me stolen stuff all the time. Everything from stolen car phones to you know the ones in the box and stereos and everything. I buy it all, bro. I buy a car battery if it was a good one. I would cash them out with like a joint, half a quarter ounce, half ounce, whatever. Then I take it up to my, my uncle's pawn shop, my, my uncle's friend's pawn shop, and then sell it on consignment you know have a list of whatever and i double my money triple my money quadruple my money so that was a whole nother racket and there's a lot of thieves and scumbags in the neighborhood who just basically went around stealing stuff all the time and brought it to me and i'd give them a freaking little weed and they were happy you know you'd be surprised how similar you and spotto are man like uh it's a little bit different dynamic and stuff but your brains work the exact same way you know really like the way you're just always hustling and moving yeah really smart your brain moves fast you see shit where people don't. He's the same way. Yeah, he's yeah. Well, well, that's why Ori became Ori. You know that. You know that's why he was the fixer. You know he was a smart guy and he could see holes where no nobody else saw them. You know he knew how to fix them. He knew how to patch them. That's what he did. Like with you, most people do the can, get twelve bucks, and go. This doesn't work. But you're just like, right. nope. There's more people over here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Most people don't yeah. think yeah. like that. Yeah. That's just yeah. Cool. Exactly. I was ambitious, I guess. He's being observed and evaluated by the largest, by far the largest, criminal family around, okay? They're looking at him to see if he's one of them. Yes, where other people have a uh, family talking them down, this family is looking at it like a badge of honor. Yeah, they're getting excited. Like, look at this guy. Yeah. He's, he's going to be good. Yeah. Okay, the good news is this is where it really starts to pick up and, and get cool. Uh, the bad news is I got to stop us here. Damn you. This is going to have to be the end of part one and we're going to do part two. Yeah, I know. I said I was never going to do this, but. Uh, Damn it, Gunner. 
I know, I swear I'd never do this, but the show's <laughs> long and I got to stop. Damn me. There's a bunch of stuff to do and it's going to be worth it. But the only way to really tell this right is to break it up. And uh, it's always a punk move that I hate when I'm listening to podcasts yeah. and they make me wait a week or whatever, however long I tend to make people wait. But it's going to be worth it. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the show and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Partners in Crime. This week's episode is an adaptation of several different historical accounts. Music is courtesy of Kevin MacLeod. All sources and attribute links can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Partners in Crime Podcast. Links are in the show notes. If you didn't like the show, keep your mouth shut. No one likes a rat. <laughs>